much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to welcome you and to host this event uh, and uh, to have such a really nice diversity of things happening with the awards uh, selection and uh, industry involvement and I think a really heterogeneous group of people who all have in common, I think, that they care deeply about fighting Alzheimer's disease. And so in that spirit, without uh, much ado, I would like to ask the panelists to please come up and uh, take their seats uh, on stage uh, so that we can begin and I'll introduce them briefly. Um, I'll go with ladies first, if I may. So uh, again, Yokoyama is an assistant professor at the Memory and Aging Center at uh, UCSF, and you two can come up if you want. <laughs> it's not quite the Emmy, so, <laughs> do so, so we'll uh, try to work towards this. I know you guys are shy. But. Okay, so uh, Yen has, uh, so she's an assistant professor in the Memory and Aging Center in the Department of Neurology at UCSF and has had a very long-standing interest in the relationship between genetics and behavior, and now increasingly between genetics and uh, cognitive diseases, in particular frontotemporal dementia and also Alzheimer's disease, and uh, is in the process of making some really intriguing links between genetics, uh, clinical manifestations, and also radiological outcome measures and biomarkers. And then, uh, here we have Bruce Lamb, who is professor in the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics at Indiana University. Uh, he has a long-standing uh, track record in uh, Alzheimer's research, uh, pioneer in the development of animal models, currently leads efforts of a large new NIH initiative uh, to create better models for the disease he's thought very carefully about how to dissect disease mechanisms and find entry points for therapeutic interventions, uh, turning his focus very much to inflammation and microglial neuronal interactions, uh, so brings that perspective to the table. And then uh, we have Guy Seabrook, uh, whom I know for a long time uh, from his days at Merck. Before he was at Merck, uh, he was uh, at Eli Lilly and now has been with Johnson & Johnson Innovation for a while. He's Vice President uh, of Scientific Innovation in the Neuroscience uh, area and brings to the table a lot of experience in drug discovery and has thought also uh, about Alzheimer's for many, many years. So the, the topic we picked uh, is inflammation and the way this is going to go is I'm going to just start off the questions and then I uh, trust that you guys are going to pose others and then we'll turn to the audience and actually uh, open it up and, and hopefully in the end we will have a dialogue between the panel and the audience and I'm going to just try to uh, make sure we uh, don't miss anybody who wants to make a contribution in this area. So I think you know there are many, many, many uh, pieces of evidence suggesting that inflammation plays a role. And it would be very interesting if each one of you could perhaps comment for us what role you think is the predominant one that inflammation plays. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it causal? Is it progression? At which point does it come in? Uh, is it uh, possible to target it? And if so, how? So, you know, have a crack at it. Whoever wants to go first, please. Should I start? I can, I can start. Um, so I think maybe just a little bit of uh, background. So first, let me thank you for hosting this great event, and thanks to the Alzheimer's Association, the, the Northern uh, California chapter, Nevada chapter, for, for hosting this. It's a great, when I saw the lineup, uh, it was very exciting to be able to participate um, here today. Um, so in terms of inflammation and Alzheimer's disease, I would just first give a little bit of history. Um, so. Alice Alzheimer actually was probably the first person who actually first noticed um, that there actually is accumulation, basically, of what we call, what we think of as really, really immune cells of the brain, you know, clustering around <coughs> amyloid plaques, you know, and one of the key pathological hallmarks. And if you go back to his original drawings, his incredible drawings of these cells that are sort of intimately associated with the plaques. And really from, I would argue, from that moment forward, um, there was sort of a chicken and egg kind of uh, discussion uh, about sort of, okay, were those cells there, those immune cells there, and basically in response to what was going on, or were they actually participating in the process? And I think that's really where we were up until a few years ago, uh, when we started to get evidence through genetics 
uh, of human Alzheimer's disease, that there are actually uh, genetic polymorphisms and genes that are ex only expressed in these types of immune cells um, that increase or decrease risk for Alzheimer's disease. And I think that probably is the first good suggestion that you, they are linked to pathogenic mechanisms of disease um, and potentially are therapeutic targets. In terms of your question, you know, sort of when do we act, how do we act, um, I think that's still evolving in my mind. Um, I think, like elsewhere, I think there's gonna, probably going to be different stages, especially for the immune system. I think accumulating evidence suggests initially probably this response, especially early on when the amyloid first deposits, may be in fact a very protective uh, response that this is a way for these cells, these immune cells, to sort of wall off amyloid and protect the rest of the brain. Um, but that, over time, fails and has its counteracting, you know, um, I'd say longer term chronic consequences uh, within the brain. So I don't know if that helps answer it, but I think that's at least from my perspective sort of a starting point for our conversation. Um, and we are going to have to understand, I think, to really ultimately target immune pathways, have uh, better biomarkers, for example, of the immune system, or we have great biomarkers now, or pretty good ones for amyloid and tau, the two neuropathological hallmarks. We don't have great biomarkers yet, I would argue, for sort of immune activation, as particularly we want to be able to know across this, the different stages of disease in the 20-year disease course, you know, when does the immune system get activated and how does that change over time? And that's what we're ultimately going to need to know in terms of designing therapies. So. Right, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would have said everything that Dr. Lamb said, and um, I guess I can add two points to nuance all of the points that he mentioned. Um, you know, as a human geneticist, we think, uh, I think often not just of single genetic variants that can predispose an individual to risk, but really the effect of that variant in the context of the rest of the genomic variation in that individual, um, you know, and of course coupled with their environments in their life. So, you know, I think it's clear from the human genetics, uh, as he said, that, you know, it, there is a role, and I would say also, at least to a certain extent, causally, um, in promoting risk for Alzheimer's disease in the context of inflammation and immune dysfunction or a, a lack of a good immune response. I think it could go either way. Um, I, I think we do need to think about it in the context of the other genetic variants that people carry that may drive their disease uh, into certain parts of the brain versus others that may end up uh, affecting their clinical presentation of disease and their age of onset of disease. Um, and there's probably also, I would say, a, a clear role of age. Um, you know, we know age, um, increasing age is the largest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, I think sometimes in neurodegenerative disease research, we uh, neglect to think about the, the roles of the aging body and the aging brain in the context of disease risk. And so certainly changes in immune response or dysfunction may also influence pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. Thanks. Thank you. And again, thank you for hosting us today and for all of you coming. It's a really terrific afternoon, so looking forward to the discussion, hearing from the other presentations later on this afternoon. Um, I'm going to approach the answer to your question from a, more from the drug discovery side, hence my, my background. But I think what we're seeing here when you look at biotechs and how the field is evolving uh, in this space, we, we're seeing a paradigm shift in how people are approaching the immune system and uh, the approach to think about new therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. I see this as an extremely healthy and uh, very exciting um, time. Um, if you look back over the last 10, 20 years, um, we've been dealing with a legacy of um, studies that have been conducted on what we regard as being anti-inflammatory mechanisms, NSAIDs, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, and things like that, uh, that while they work extremely effectively in the animal models, don't work in the disease state. And, and one could legitimately ask the question about the timing of intervention, um, which, uh, as we've learned over the last five to ten years now that we need to be thinking much earlier in terms of uh, intervention in uh, the treatment of Alzheimer's disease so that we can prevent the disease in the first place. Uh, but I think we've also been confused a little bit by the mechanical issues. When people talk about inflammation, you start thinking about an inflamed foot or a blister or things like that. And clearly in the brain, the inflammatory processes that are taking place are very nuanced and involve many different pathways. But the 
key thing that's, uh, I think, helped create this paradigm shift for us is the understanding of the human genetics, because uh, we now have uh, some fundamental pathways to go after um, that um, come from multiple different families, uh, which point to similar common mechanisms. So we th to think about things like CD33 and TREN2 is in one case in point. Um, and that really is, I, I think, extremely exciting, because some of these are not just rare uh, variants, but are very common variants. Um, and so it suggests that there are, the etiology of the disease is going to be multifaceted in uh, where it presents with the, the symptoms of the disease, but it's given us clues as to how there will be certain pathways we can go after uh, that will be effective secondary treatments uh, for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. So I'm an optimist. You have been an optimist in drug discovery. And I see this as an extremely uh, exciting time in Alzheimer's research. And, and I'm delighted to see... The fact also, it's not just about information, it's about people working together. And what we're hearing and seeing today is part of that process with the Alzheimer's Association joining forces with a big pharma company to help host an event like this. Um, the folk in the audience from the biotech and ac academic community, I think together we can crack it. And I'm really excited about this space. Great, well, thank you very much. I, I want to open it up for questions of the audience and uh, see if, um, or any additional comments or uh, obstacles in the field you want to highlight. I could ask a question uh, uh, from the drug discovery perspective. Do you, th I, um, perhaps the answer is both, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether you think it would be more tractable to target um, the innate immune system, you know, things like microglia and complement that are potentially uh, killing neurons versus um, adaptive immune <coughs> system that may be responding to a certain extent in a protective role, at least at first. And of course, both systems do both protective and bad things, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, clearly if you look at the human genetics and the GWAS studies, the majority of the um, uh, mutations and steps occur in, the, in genes associated with the innate immune system, so I'd probably start there as being at the place I'd, I'd look first. Um, and, but the, the key question, I think, uh, um, is around when do you intervene in the disease? Because um, it's very clear that the type of um, uh, inflammatory process is going on in uh, MCI versus late stage is very different. I'm sure it's very different with someone who um, is in ARET, as an example. Um, so uh, I think we need to be more um, cautious about how we go about um, approaching therapeutic intervention, we need to be thinking about the timing of intervention and also potentially looking at um, uh, individuals uh, from the standpoint of subsets of the disease. In the same way that you look at diseases like depression, um, there are subsets of depression, some are maybe related to inflammation, others may not. Um, and I think as we uh, get a more detailed understanding of the nuances of the disease, that's going to help inform how we approach um, uh, therapeutic intervention in the longer term. Um, but I, I would add, and this is a, you know, one of the paradoxes, is that we see inflammation in many different diseases. So why does one form of inflammation cause Alzheimer's disease and another form of inflammation cause a, a different disease? So um, in that context, again, we need to be thinking carefully about what creates the selective vulnerability that causes a, a given neurodegenerative disease in the first place. Audience questions? Eliza? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Eliezer Maslia from NIA. Um, there is always a, a confusion as to if, uh, at least uh, in any immune system inflammation or not, it is a, it is a driver, or is it terminal, or is it uh, uh, enhancing uh, the Alzheimer pathology? What, what do you think the role of inflammation? Uh, falls at the very initial stages of the disease and throughout the disease, or at later stages? Uh... I'll take a crack at it. <laughs> um, I think some of our data, um, and again, I think there's other, other pieces of data that suggest this as well. Um, yeah, I mean, what, we think one of the first things that occurs, certainly in the disease, is amyloid. It aggregates within the brain. And our suggestions are that it pretty much there's an immediate response. You know, to that in terms of especially the, the, these microglia and macrophages that sort of accumulate around the amyloid. I think most of the evidence suggests now that they actually are probably partly there to sort of help sort of compact the amyloid and keep it from having effects outside um, that immediate area. So they're basically walling off amyloid. 
Um, and TREM2 is, is one, of the, one of the genes that was mentioned. Uh, we now know that one of its major functions is to actually get those cells to where they need to be. And so when you, not, if you remove TREM2, those cells don't get there, and you no longer have this, these compact plaques, and, the, and it causes sort of more problems longer on. But I think what's interesting to start to see, I mean, TREM2 is just the farthest along, I think, because we've studied a little bit longer. Um, and there's starting to be evidence now of fluid biomarkers that TREM2 actually increases um, in, in cerebral spinal fluid, the soluble version of TREM2, early in disease. And actually, but later in disease, it actually looks like it starts to go down. And I think that's really where I think we're going to start to think, have to start thinking about, again, that these genes may be playing different roles at different stages of disease. Uh, and I think that's what some of our evidence in the animal models suggests that actually at early on may actually be, you know, again, this very protective role, but later on actually that may be part of the thing that even drops tau pathology, uh, for example, later in the disease of loss of these cells um, later on. So I think it could have this dual-edged role, one very protective early in disease and one may be detrimental later in disease. Again, that's just one example, and I think as we understand what some of these newer genes that have been identified very recently, um, you know, I think we'll see whether they fit into that same category or not. I mean, it seems to me intriguing that, you know, the most, arguably, most advanced investigational Alzheimer compound is, you know, in part of the immune system and something, I mean, I think, if one would think of immunization as a strategy to fight a disease that is thought to be partly due to inflammation. It's a little counterintuitive, at least, yet the antibody seems to be the furthest advance. So, and the trend two story also would suggest that maybe there are deficiencies in the immune responses rather than an overactivation of the immune response. And so, you know, should we be focusing more on boosting immune responses than on subduing them, because certainly the efforts in the latter direction have failed in the past. You know, the Correct. And, I, and I, if you look at the weight of evidence, the majority of it, and there are always exceptions, of course, is that there's a, a loss of function in microglial phagocytosis, as a good case in point. So <coughs> if you were to improve um, um, the, the right form of phagocytosis, that might be a good thing. Um, but there are uh, you know, many examples where, again, so it comes back to this timing issue, when, when do you intervene and, and uh, can you get to the, uh, the individuals at the right point in time? And there's likely to be heterogeneity within the brain itself um, as um, certain areas of the brain are undergoing an advanced form of neurodegeneration, others are just starting um, as you start to see the progression of uh, the tauopathy through the various branch stages. And that, that is another complexity, you know, if, you, if you're dealing with a a heterogeneous in, um, um, inflammatory response. Um, uh, how do you do, deal with that in a, a way that is not going to adversely affect other areas of the, of the brain as well? I don't have an answer to that question, but perhaps I can work, work with thoughts from the audience. Also, I think the audience should feel free not only to ask questions, but also to share their wisdom with us. So yeah. if you have good <laughs> in, insights on any of the yeah. points that are brought up, please uh, I want mention them. Jorge Pelo, last one. I wonder whether you could elaborate a little bit about the, you know, the genetic links to you know, increase the susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease related to the immune system, and whether we, because uh, for me it seems that most of the genes has been linked are breaking points of the immune system that unmask Alzheimer's disease, and it's actually hard to find genes that are detrimental gain of function. So, so which will speak that you know it's really reduction of the immune activity that is associated with them unmasking the, the Alzheimer's disease phenotype. So do you see the, you know, the genetic link in a similar way that I see it? Or do you see some genes that could be you know, gain, the detrimental gain of function? Well, so CD33 would fit into that bucket. Um, so um, CD33 acts as a break of microglial activity. Um, and, um, if you um, look at the interrelationship between TREM2 and CD33, then that may be one pathway where if you can inhibit CD33, that may be a good thing to do, as you have to be proven, I guess. But, uh, uh, comments? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there is some evidence in mouse models suggesting a, a 
and research from Ben Maris and Beth Stevens suggesting that complement the complement system is involved in the synaptic pruning that is good in development but not so good in neurodegeneration. And so to a certain extent, I think, um, of course, depending on the timing of disease, you know, we're ramping down some of that complement mediated uh, pro-inflammatory synaptic trimming uh, or destruction could also be protected. And I, I would just add, I don't necessarily think it has to be, you know, all or one or all or all the other. Um, so what I mean by that is um, that our four, like the R47H variant of TRIM2, that's the major risk variant. Um, you know, we have data um, using animal models that that certain certain things, when we look at certain aspects like this macrophage accumulation, it definitely looks like a loss of function. But then there's other phenotypes that we look at where it doesn't look like loss of function. So that's where I think... Again, we, we still are at the beginning points of trying to understand. I, th I, I take your point, and I think it is important to think that there is certainly a loss of function aspect, and I think that may be the age-related um, aspect that we're really blocking about. I mean, it's long been known that your immune system, you know, with age, is, is declining in terms of its activity, and that may be one of the factors by which, you know, again, age is the major risk. Um, but again, I'd sort of say some of the new variants that have been isolated, I'd sort of say we don't know yet. Uh, the, the jury's still out. Do we have a question here and then over there? Yes. Yeah. So I've been interested in NF kappa B signaling for a little while, and in particular, CRL malfunctions. Mm, that's the one protein of the NF kappa B family that probably has received the least attention, appear to be causative to some developments of diabetes, and because there is a crosstalk between diabetes, in particular type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. I wonder whether one can somehow distill a bigger picture from this. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, it certainly is a, you know, I mean, an immune dis dysregulation in type 2 diabetes. I guess, again, whether it's going to be, you know, it's all immune dysregulation, how do we sort of start to sort of get to the point where we need to be, which is, okay, what are the exact pathways that are engaged, that are driving an Alzheimer's-like pathology versus others, as somebody sort of mentioned earlier, and I don't think we're there yet. Um, I mean, yeah, the nf kappa B signaling differences are definitely seen in other forms of neurodegeneration, like frontotemporal dementia, caused by proprioneal and haploid sufficiency. Uh, TNF-alpha signaling and NF-kappa B signaling are definitely dysregulated as they relate to monocytes and microglia, which we know are important in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. But I think, you know, how the diseases may share neurological <coughs> pathways that can either either shunt people in one way or the other or give you shared risk for both is not clear. Although there's one interesting, I was just thinking about, there's actually just one interesting, uh, Christian Haas and colleagues um, published a paper about a month ago um, where they made uh, a, an animal model that had one of these trim 2 variants. It's not, it wasn't an Alzheimer's disease risk variant, it was a, one that causes more like an FTD-like uh, syndrome. Uh, and when he looked, they looked in the animal models, um, they had data uh, showing that there was really massive dysregulation of um, cerebral uh, blood flow and, and uh, metabolism actually within the brain. Just due to this, again, and you really start thinking about it, it's really quite amazing that this gene, which is only expressed really in microglia, we think, and then in macrophages more generally, and yet it has this sort of whole system-wide effect on cerebral blood flow and, and glucose uh, metabolism. And so I think that, to me, again, suggests there's some links that we really understand almost nothing about right now. <laughs> uh, and, but I think it suggests potential new biology uh, that we, we could potentially understand. So I, think, so I think there is some evidence that there's links there, but I, don't, I wouldn't argue we really know what they are yet. Do you know any from a drug development standpoint? I was just going to make a comment. I think from a from a discovery standpoint, the, the challenges when you're dealing with a mechanism like that is, is ubiquitous, and um, so we're trying to find what sort of, what sort of targets that are ex exquisitely expressed in the brain, so you can get around the issues with side effects. I mean, if you can do that, that's great. But um, many of the, the most effective drugs we have work on many different uh, uh, cells and pathways throughout the body, but it just adds to the complexity of conducting a drug discovery campaign because you're, you're dealing with that baggage in the background that you can have some peripheral side effect that is going to pop up that you just haven't uh, anticipated in, in, in the course of your work. 
we can become very you know, monocular focused on neurons and uh, the glia in the brain, but uh, we really do need to think about the safety and the side effect tolerability profile um, as we move these types of programs forward. That's not to say that biology is not important to the underlying disease, but it's, it just affects our chances of success of bringing forward the therapeutic that's going to work. Question over there. Okay. Um, last year there is a uh, report by a group of uh, Swedish uh, scientists who found on among uh, this about 32,000 men in Europe. Uh, they found that there is a mosaic loss of the Y chromosome in their lymphocytes and they are predisposed to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I, I have two questions. One is, in genetic point of view, uh, what type of gene in the Y chromosome is protecting men from Alzheimer's? Uh, second is that what type of uh, immune response or any other mechanism that might uh, that can explain this kind of phenomenon? I'm glad I'm not sitting in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think it's a fascinating question. I have read the paper, so I can't really comment. But um, uh, yeah. it's so I. You know, in the spirit of interesting collaborations, I've actually started recently collaborating with Charles Ryan, who's in our cancer department. Um, he, he's primarily focused on prostate cancer. And we've been thinking about how, uh, with Joel Kramer, how androgen deprivation may actually contribute to cognitive decline in aging men. Um, and this is a very, you know, untapped area. And it, it's something that came to mind as you were describing the study. Um, I do not know exactly how it would relate, or um, if that is relevant, but I might speculate that that could right. be a way. Right, androgen receptors on chromosome X. Right. So what, what does the Y have to do with androgen receptor on the Y chromosome? The <laughs> men already differentiated into uh, male, so I mean that's, uh, that's the Y chromosome we're talking about, they were talking about, so it really puzzled me a lot. And I, I work on the Y chromosome. That's why I want to really have a feedback from experts like you to tell me exactly what's going on with the uh, Y chromosome that could have. So I, I, you know, I have to say in, in defense of our panel that they were uh, you know, picked to comment on inflammation. And, uh, <laughs> so, so I don't know. So, you, you know, and of course, uh, so I, I think there may very well be regulatory effects, so there are so many things residing on uh, these, uh, you know, X and Y chromosomes that are very interesting. But, but the cells that lost the Y chromosome are lymphocytes, so they're involved in right. the response. Yes, right. yeah. Well, yeah, so yeah, well, then the question becomes fascinating. Yeah, I, I mean, do they look at, that they also looked in the brain, you know, yeah. in these yeah. somatic mosaicism yeah. going on in the brain. Yeah. Or, yeah. Do you know yeah. Yeah. Variety I mean, if, you know, if the, if the lymphocytes, I mean, there is a lot of evidence from Michael Schwartz's lab, for example, and a very, and Kipnis's group, and so on, that, you know, lymphocytes are quite important for the maintenance of cognitive function. So one could imagine that, you know, if there is some, something that destabilizes the chromatin structure or any other aspect of the lymphocytes, that, you know, there now may be failure in protective mechanisms. And clearly, I think, you know, it, it's really fascinating that the elements of the adaptive immune system are quite important for cognitive maintenance, especially during the aging process. So, but the exact mechanisms, I don't think we can know uh, without further investigation. Melanie. Hi, um, so my question is about the predictive power of animal models. Um, and I'm going to use the, the example of um, complement. Um, so knocking out complement in one animal model versus another animal model yields different and opposite results. How do we know which one's the truth? And how do we, um, do we test all of them? Um, do we, do we, is there, are there other ways we can figure out what is more accurate, which model is more accurate? That's a great question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, actually I uh, lead, it's, a, it's called the Model Organism Development and Evaluation for Late Onset Alzheimer's Disease. It's a consortium of now four uh, different institutions, um, Indiana University, uh, the Jackson Labs, 
uh, in Bar Harbor, um, UC Irvine, um, and Sage Bio Networks. Um, and the goal of this project, uh, funded by the NIA, is actually to do just that. Uh, to sort of try to, A, we focused a lot on early onset disease. Um, now, with genetics being more mature, we've, and the ability to do genome editing, um, and sort of, you know, in a new era of uh, ability to man manipulate the mammalian genome, was to generate better models, but then more importantly, actually compare them um, side by side, as close as we can to human disease. Um, and so that's really what our goal is. Um, so we're going to be you know, deep phenotyping these animals using, you know, as close as we can, uh, from uh, RNA seq to brain imaging to you know every every modality that we can think of that we can align to the human disease. Uh, and the goal again is is to sort of see how close we can get. Um, you know, now using systems biology, we can even start to look at okay, are there things we're missing? And animal models that are present in the human disease. I mean, those, those types of questions, and that's really what what the goal of this project is: is to get the models, deep, deeply phenotype them, make them available to the entire scientific community, um, and then make all the data available. Um, so, if you go, I think it's modelad.org um, is the website. It's our website. We already have. Um, about a dozen models, I think, that we've made in this first year that are already available um, to be you know, ordered from the Jackson Labs. Um, and then all the data will be stored at Sage Bio Networks. Um, so um, they have a data portal. All of our data uh, within six months of, of QC will be released uh, to the scientific community. Uh, so again, but the purpose really is just, just that. But this data then will be out there and we'll have everything, all our uh, uh, stand SOPs for how the animals were housed, what conditions they were in, what the diet was, what you know, the light cycle was, everything as far as we can do, <coughs> put it out there. Uh, again, we'll have animals being phenotyped now at three different locations as well. So both Indiana, Far Harbor, and now here in, in, in California. So again, that should help also our power of, 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 of getting results that are reproducible across the field, because I agree, I think it's been an issue uh, for the field. Thank you very much, uh, again. Uh, I was just going to make one plug also for um, human cells. So we, you know, we can take advantage of the fact that people are becoming increasingly interested in clinical research uh, to look at fibroblasts, where we're can, we can now test biological questions in the context of the individual's genome um, and induce those cells to become neurons and microglia. Thank you. Last question. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we're dealing with uh, inflammation and Alzheimer's. So I think this is appropriate. I haven't heard anybody talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And I think this is one of the early findings that, that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs could reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. John Brighton of the Cache County study suggested there could be as much as a 90% reduction in risk, which is probably one of the biggest risks of any factor I'm aware of except for genetic. Um, developed in a New England journal said that in order to really get an effect, you have to start the drugs about three years before the dementia started to really start getting that benefit. And Eddie Koo came along from UC San Diego and said that it wasn't really an inflammatory mechanism, it was something to do with modulating where the gamma secretase cleave the, uh, the, uh, the beta secretase product in the amyloid pre protein. And then, um, then that led to the huge study of fluorobiprofen, which turned out to be a massive failure, but it was done on Alzheimer patients who were well into their disease. So it was never really studied in the early patients to see if it might have an effect. So, after all, you know, the incredible work that was done in this area, where, what's the status of the NSAIDs at this point? A very interesting question, and uh, you, you correctly point out the, the, the difference between pre-treatment with uh, NSAIDs versus treat, treating people who have the disease. And it's coming back to the, the, the challenge I mentioned right at the beginning, which is that um, we're dealing with a legacy here of a lot of studies that have been done in mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease where these drugs attack inflammatory processes that have been tested in mice that work very effectively don't work in humans. And part of the answer to that question may be the timing of when you intervene and the nature of the inflammatory event that's occurring. Um, and I still believe that's an open question. The same question I think exists with respect to looking at cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, you know, if you, um, um, there's, there's quite a work from Ben Malozin looking at, um, from what he, he did, looking at the VA databases, looking at um, the risk of getting dementia, whether you've taken a statin or not taken a statin. And there are similar trials that we've done in multi-moderate um, Alzheimer's disease that don't show benefit. So I think we are dealing with a, tr a challenge here of interpreting uh, the field's results based on 
epidemiological data uh, which is treating people for uh, years, decades before they have the disease versus doing a short 18 month study in uh, very advanced stages of the disease. So there's still an open question to my mind as to whether uh, if you were to be able to do a study prospectively um, over uh, in, say an A-rep patient population um, whether those drugs may or may not be effective. And that certainly is where the field is going but as you can appreciate those studies are extremely expensive to conduct and they take a long time to do. Um, and so uh, it, we maybe need um, other, uh, function, other areas to help contribute to the conduct of those studies. Maybe governments or other agencies could help with that, but um, are very challenging to fund uh, at the level of the biotech uh, community or even in big pharma, just because of the cost basis and the nature of the studies. Um, so it's an open question, I think, um, a very fair question as to whether there are ways in which we can prevent Alzheimer's disease that go beyond uh, just treating the symptoms once someone gets the disease. And, and I think there's very exciting uh, data around the things that people can do in the midlife to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease around looking after the heart, looking after cholesterol, looking after yeah, doing exercise, not smoking, things like that, um, which I think will again also have a huge impact to the overall uh, risk of uh, getting Alzheimer's disease. And thank you very much. I, I just in the spirit of time, a quick, really last question and a brief answer. Uh, uh, I'm interested to hear a view about uh, how information interacts with diabetes and uh, hypercholesterolemia, and, and uh, since they are very strong epidemiological risk factors and certainly very prevalent in, in our society, and and how you conceptually try to compare the sort of protein GWAS results with trying to see how, if they really are impacted by environmental factors like, like glucose and cholesterol. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of gen genetic overlap uh, indicating uh, changes in lipid metabolism in Alzheimer's disease risk and obviously in the diseases you mentioned. I can't help but think that age is a factor, um, but also it's clear you know, even from the small studies that your environment and your diet will impact whether things like ApoE4 can be protective versus uh, disadvantageous. And I would assume it would be the same for other risk factors related to cholesterol metabolism. Thank you very much. I, join me please in thanking the panel members. <laughs>